All right, so let's get started here. Enough storytelling. Crazy things I've done. Hmm. Someday I might write a book. <clears throat> Everybody else does, right? I don't understand that. These neat. No, I'm not going to, because we're recording, so. But the pastor will hopefully edit that out. <clears throat> All right, let's pray and then we'll get started. Lord, we thank you for this day and the opportunity to be in your house. Lord, teach us this morning as we study uh, your word. Help us, Lord, to be focused on you today and set aside the cares of the world. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so last week we kind of took a little bit of a sidestep to the sidestep that we're taking. Uh, looking at, we start. We talked about two weeks ago, we talked about self-examination uh, and some of the good and bad of self-examination. And then last week we kind of stepped away from that and talked about uh, current events, Israel, right? So we're not going to do that this week. I think if you saw the email, the pastor's going to get into some of that tonight. Uh, I believe that's what the email said this evening. Uh, he's going to talk about Israel and, and how, um, you know, what we might see from the Bible as far as what's happening um, right now. I would encourage you, because there's a lot of information that's being you know, put in the, in the media, there's just a lot of information from both sides. And I've, I've seen both sides. I've watched, you know, videos from the Palestinian perspective that are, you know, uh, uh, Muslims that are, you know, having that type of a conversation. And I've watched the other side uh, from the Jewish perspective. For, I, I will just say this. I, I would recommend that we do the research and understand the history because it can become a little bit confusing if we don't really know, like Palestine, where does that come from? Is there really such a thing as the Palestinian people, right? Those kind of things. What does that mean? Um, how, how, how can we be certain? Now, as Christians, we don't necessarily have an issue because we know what the Bible says about where the Jews got the land from. It was God gave it to them, right? He told them, here's the boundaries. No question about that. Uh, but how does that play into modern times and where are the kind of the legal parameters of Israel's claim to the, the property. And really, that's, that's what this is all about. It's about the land and who claims ownership of the land. So anyway, Pastor will get into more of that tonight. But I would just encourage you to do um, a little bit of research, make sure that we understand the history and we're not kind of led off track by something that's not true. Because there's a lot of things that are being said that are not true, okay, on both sides to drum up support for both parties, okay? Uh, but anyway, as Christians and as a nation, we must continue to stand with Israel, God's people. The Bible tells us that those that don't, you have a future that's not so bright. So we're, we need to stand with Israel for sure, okay? So to get back, uh, we talked about self-examination and some of that. Now we're going to continue a little bit with that this morning, you can turn, while uh, I give kind of some introduction here, turn to Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Not a book that we go to very often, but there's some very relevant, it's all relevant of course, but there's something very relevant to the topic this morning. So as we talked about self-examination, the, the challenge with that is we look inward at ourselves, and then the idea that we're not so great, right? We see things in our we see things in our life that are not so great, and we want to try to fix them ourselves. And we talked about self help and self improvement, uh, and how that can be dangerous because as Christians, the help that we need 
doesn't come from within ourself, right? It comes from within the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. That's where the help comes from. But another part of this then is as we look at ourselves or, or we, we continue to evaluate who we are in our position as soldiers with, within uh, the Lord's army, um, we have to understand we're not alone. Have you, let me ask, that, have you ever felt alone? Have you ever felt like you just, it's you against the world? Right? I, I see some of you, and I can tell by your facial response, yes, you have. Right? Um, and, and some of us, you know, married, have spouses. It, can you feel alone if you have a partner, somebody next to you? Sure, you still can feel like it's, you're, you're in this by yourself. And, and when you look at things from a military perspective, um, the Army doesn't go out and send individuals, right? That's why they have a structure. The smallest of that is a team, and then it grows higher, you know, platoon and a company and so on and so forth, and it gets larger and larger. But we're not in this alone. And, and we'll look some more, and I don't know if we'll get to it this morning, but, but really what I want us to get to is this idea of our love for each other and our responsibility to be an encouragement to each other. Okay? But for today, at least for right now anyway, let's look at this idea of a team. It's not me. Right? I'm not in this alone. We should be looking at this um, as a team effort. And that's really what the church is, right? The church was formed for believers to come together with a purpose. We're not just here to enjoy social interaction, although that's necessary, right? We need to have fellowship one with another. But the local church was formed for us to have a purpose, to take the, mis the, the, the uh, uh, message of the gospel into the world in various ways that we do that, okay? Um, so what is a team? What is a team? Anybody? Okay, you're reading my notes over here, I think, right? So the well, actually you're reading the armies. Uh, so the army, the army defines a team or talks about a team, is any group of people that functions together to accomplish a mission or perform a collective task. A team's work is interdependent, and team members share responsibility and accountability for attaining results. There's no size limit to a team. Teams are complex, dynamic groups that range from two people to thousands of individuals. So, so a team is at least two people, any number, with a shared purpose, working together to, to reach that common goal. Army organizations rely on effective teams to complete tasks, achieve, achieve objectives, and accomplish missions. The ability to build teams through mutual trust and maintain effective, cohesive teams throughout military operations is an essential skill for commanders, and they need to build teams, and it goes on and talks about that. A key to effective teamwork is the cooperative or coordinated effort of individuals acting together as a group or in the interest of a common goal. So do we, as Christians, have a common goal? Yes, okay, what is it? What is our common goal? To share the gospel, right? That's why, we're, that's why we're still here. That's why, you know, we were called. Jesus said, take the message and, and to go out into the world. And we are a group. We're a group of, you know, how many ever are in membership here, okay? So we have a responsibility for, for taking that out. Um, now, if our common goal, if our purpose is to take the message of the gospel to the world, um, is that easy? No. 
it can be very difficult sometimes, right? There are challenges. Cultural challenges, missionaries face all the time, right? Cultural challenges, language challenges, just being away from home if you're going to go and serve on a missions field. It can be mentally and both physically taxing, right, to be engaged when, especially when people are not receptive. Can, uh, can become uh, discouraging if people aren't listening. It's stressful sometimes. And in some parts of the world, and even, uh, and it's growing, and even here in the United States, it can become dangerous to even go into certain locations and to say the name of Jesus and to talk about what he's done for them, for, for those that need him. And it, it can be dangerous. And that's one thing that we don't see really spoken of much uh, in the media, either print or on television, is the persecution of Christians around the world. How many countries are persecuting Christians or, or limiting you know, Christian uh, assembly that don't have the Bible, right? We see things on the news about other groups, but not so much with Christians. Now, um, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, let's look at verses 9 through 12. Because this, this mission that we're on, we, we should be working together. Now, verse, beginning at verse uh, 9 of Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if one fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a three co threefold cord is not quickly broken. So what, what's, the, what's the message? What's the message? We need to be a team, right? So we're going to face things that it's easier to deal with when you have someone with you. Okay? And we put this into the context of us taking the message of the gospel. Verse 9 says, two are better than one because they have a greater reward, their labor. You can do more when you work together than you can by yourself. You can accomplish more, right? Verse 10, if one falls, then the other will be there to help him up. Does that happen? Do we stumble and fall? You don't have to raise your hand, but how many stumbled and fell this week? <laughs> We've talked about that before, right, in, the, in this context of examining ourselves in, in, in uh, uh, perspective of God's expectation of holiness. When we try to measure ourselves up against his standard, we fail. We're going to fail. We can't match up to holiness. That's what we, we have been commanded to be, is holy because he is holy. But how, how do we do that? And when we fail, if we're alone, and we have this sense of, well, it's me against the world, and I, I fail, I don't do well, or as in, in uh, verse 10 it says, I fall, and if there's no one there, now i got to get myself back up. Now we get into that whole cycle that we talked about a couple weeks ago with regard, to, um, with regard to being discouraged and then potentially even, even uh, falling into depression. Okay? So the benefits of working together as a team... Uh, greatly outweigh us trying to do things alone. Now think of it from the perspective of a church. How much more then can we accomplish if we work together as, an, as a corporate entity or as a church, right? How many do we have in, in membership here at Cedar Hill? Anybody? 160 some. I think we're getting close to 170. I don't remember, Jason, the last uh, board meeting how many but it's, it's close to 170 members on pay, that have formally joined the church. Now, obviously, we have 
many more than that that, that attend, especially on you know, Sunday morning service. But when we pull our physical resources, right, financial resources, our understanding, and we talked, we've talked some about our different talents. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But when we pull our different talents together and form a team, and, and we are focused on the same thing, what we're able to accomplish is much greater than. And it's always nice when if there's someone next to you, if you slip and fall, that, that is there to reach out and help you back up. That's understanding and, and compassionate towards you, right? We don't need people around us that when you slip and fall are going to laugh at you and make fun or poke at you and point at you and condemn you for what happened. It, it happens to all of us, right? Because we have an enemy, remember? And that's what he's trying to do, is he's trying to get us to slip and fall and stay down. And when you're trying to work this alone, sometimes it's easier just to stay down there, right? Man, I don't want to get back up. People are going to poke at me or, you know, find out or whatever. It's just easier to stay down here. But we can't do that. Uh, verse 11 talks about two lying together. Just think about when it's cold. Now, some of you probably have never been there. I will admit I have. I've been in a foxhole in the winter, and it's been cold. And do we huddle together for warmth? Yes, we did, okay? <laughs> because it was cold, and that's what that verse is talking about, right? You can't build a fire if you're out in a combat because now they know where you are. Right? So we had to huddle together. And when it's like yesterday, I was, at, I, I was at the Army Heritage and Education Center yesterday, and today are the Army Expo. So I was there yesterday. And fortunately, they assigned me indoors, so I didn't have to stand out in the freezing rain like everybody else. But some of us were joking around saying, well, this is just a typical Army day. It's raining and cold, so, you know, that's when the Army does stuff is when it's raining and cold. We don't do things when it's nice and bright and sunny. But when you looked out there, there were reenactors from different periods of history, and guess what they were doing? They were all huddling together to try to keep warm. And I've been out in certain locations by myself when it's really cold, and I didn't like it. Like, you know, you go out, hunting season's coming up. You go out there in the woods by yourself, it's pretty cold, right? <laughs> so it's better to, to have someone there. And in verse 12, if one prevails or if someone tries to come against you, and we know that there is one that's coming against us all the time. Again, we talked about our enemy, the adversary that we face, the devil. He's there every step of the way. And if we're trying to deal with these things on our own, we're, we're, we're going to have a very, very difficult time. It's a lot, and that's why it's important for us to meet here, right? To come together in this place, to listen to the word, to, to listen to, you know, the preaching, to sing together, to fellowship together, to get to know each other so that we can be more, uh, more beneficial, more productive for each other, right? That's what the church is all about. So when we build teams, when the army talks about building teams, there are lots and lots of exercises that we would go through that we would call team building exercises, right? To, to bond, to bring people. Now, not everybody has the same personality. We've talked about some of that before. Some folks are a little easier to get along with than others, and that's just who we are, right? But that's okay. We, we have to remember that we have a common purpose, a common goal. Our goal is to get the gospel out there, to grow the kingdom of heaven. And we can't do that alone. We need to work together to do that, right? Turn to Mark, Mark chapter 6. So Jesus used a team, right? Mark chapter 6, start with verse 7. But Jesus 
pulled 12 guys together and formed a team. And they were from all different walks of life. You had a tax collector. You had fishermen. Right? You had a doctor, medical guy, apparently. So all of these people, all these men from different backgrounds came together and Jesus brought them and he, he taught them, right, what they should do. They, he used himself as the example to, to take the message out and to preach, to show compassion, to love people. He was their example. So they were constantly in training because there was something that they were supposed to do he was preparing them for what was to come next. And he had them go on some exercises even before he left this earth, before his ascension into heaven. So in verse 7 we see, And he, Jesus, called unto him the twelve, and began to send them forth by two and two, and gave them power over unclean spirits. So, so he brings the twelve together, and he's like, okay, guys, we're, we're going to have a little exercise. You've been with me for a while. You've seen that, you know, you've, you've heard the gospel. You heard the message. You've seen how I respond, what I do. Now, guess what? It's your turn to kind of give this a try. Because that's what you're going to do. That's what your mission is. Your mission is to continue what I'm doing after I'm gone. So guess what? He broke them up into individuals and sent them out one by one. No! <laughs> The Bible clearly tells us he sent them out two by two. Why? Because it's better for them, just like we saw in Ecclesiastes. He was following the principle that he had established in Ecclesiastes, right? Verse 8. So, so he gives them power, power over unclean spirits. Now, we're, we're not going to get into talk about whether or not we today have these types of, of powers or not, I, you know, we have the power of the Holy Spirit within us, which is great, and I don't think we exercise the power of the Holy Spirit to his full potential. I don't think we recognize that, and I think sometimes we're, uh, we're not doing that. But we're not going to get into uh, this discussion about unclean spirits and what we can and can't do and that kind of stuff, maybe for another day. Verse 8, And commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey, save a staff only, no script, or that's a bag, no bread, no money in their purse, and be shod with sandals, and put and not put on uh, two coats. So he said, you, you're going to go out just two by two. The only thing you can take with you is your staff, right? You can't even put on an extra jacket. You can't carry a bag. You can't take any money. So the, the test that he is giving them, and then what does he tell them? He tells in verse 10, he tells them, listen, in, whatever, in what place uh, soever ye enter into a house, there abide till ye depart from that place. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear you, when you depart thence, shake off the dust from under your feet, right? For a testimony against them. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. So Jesus sends with them power. Now, now he, in verse 7, it says that he gave them power because, remember, now this is before the Holy Spirit came. So he gave them, he gave them special power to go out and to do these things. And he sent them out there with nothing, nothing but a stick. Sandals, they didn't have hiking boots, right? And he says, go. He didn't tell them, you notice he didn't tell them where to go. He just said, go. And where, wherever you go, if they receive you and take care of you, right, that's, that's a great place, right? Stay with them, teach them, tell them what, what, they, what I've taught you. But if they don't receive you, then kind of shake the dust off and move on, Right? Don't waste your time there. If they're not going to listen to you, you're not going to receive you, then continue on. But he was providing for them, right, as they went out. There was a whole lot of faith and trust in God's ability to care for them. Think about a missionary today that goes to wherever, 
right? So, some remote location in the jungles of the Amazon. <laughs> what, what all goes into preparation to get there? Sometimes years worth of preparation, language study, all these other things, right? Dr drumming up, I shouldn't say drum, it's not the polite way to say it, but, but debutation to, to obtain uh, finances, the resources, shipping. Everybody wants to take stuff with them, right? So shipping all your clothes and, and your books and everything. I mean, it can take years to get to the point where you're finally on the mission field. Jesus said, nope, guess what, guys? You're leaving today. All you got is your stick, and go ahead on out there. The, the, you'll be taken care of. If they're not taking care of you, then move on. Don't spend the time there, right? Verse 12. And they went out and they preached that men should repent. That's exactly what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to go out into the world and, repeat, and, and preach the gospel. The gospel that we're sinners and you need to repent and you need to seek Christ as your Savior. Verse 13, and they cast out many devils and anointed with oil many that were sick and healed them. So they were definitely used of the Lord. What, would that, what do you think that did to their, their faith and their trust, their confidence in Jesus and who he was? I mean, that, that probably grew immensely, right? So, so this is kind of an example for us, right? I'm not saying that we need to leave everything at home and just, just go. But the example is that we should be going out into the world, out into our communities, and spreading the gospel. And, and relying solely upon the Lord to provide opportunity, to provide the resources, to provide everything that we need. And sometimes we get concerned about, well, where am I supposed to go? What am I supposed to do? Who am I... Don't worry about it. Pray for opportunity. If you ask for opportunity, the opportunity is going to come, especially if we're looking to spread the gospel. Now, so they go out there, and, and, and they're in teams of two, and they do what they're told to do. They're doing the mission. So they've had time to prep. They've trained under Jesus. He's been their master, right? The, their teacher. And now he sends them out, and they come back. Let's say how long they're gone, because this, this, this part of the account stops, right, at verse 13, and then at verse 14 it picks up with what? John the Baptist beheading. So, so now this, I, I use, I'm, I'm, you know I don't like to use this term, but now the story stops. <laughs> the disciples are gone. They're out doing what Jesus told them to do. They're out on what, the, what we would call in the army a training exercise. Right? So they're taking what they've been taught from him, and they're, now they're out exercising those skill sets themselves to become better at what, they've, what they're called to do. And the story stops. And from 14 through verse 29, it all talks about John the Baptist. So there's no account of what they faced, who, who they saw, how many believed. But we know from verse 12 and 13 that they did what they were supposed to do. They preached the gospel. They exercised the power over uh, the devils or over demons. And people were, were healed because of what they did. Now you skip ahead to verse 30. Here they come. They're coming back. And the apostles gathered themselves together unto Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught. So now they come back. So having been in locations around our world where I've been sent out on missions, me and my partner, sometimes I would have maybe two or three guys with me, but we would go out into the community, so to speak, into some precarious locations, and we would conduct our mission, and then we would come back and we would go to whoever sent us, our commander, and we would brief him, give him what we would call an after-action report on what happened. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They all came back, they gathered together with Jesus, and they told him, Hey, this is where we went. This is what we did. These are the things that we taught. This is what we saw. So they sat around and told all that had happened to, to their master, to their commander who had sent them out, right? And I'm, 
again, we don't have a lot of detail, but I'm sure Jesus, you know, was encouraging him. Oh, that's, that's great, you know, you, 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 your faith has increased, right? It was a positive encounter for them. Verse 31, and he, Jesus recognizes something here that is important for all teams, because they're out there for however long, we don't know. They're, they're involved in things. Again, it's just two of them. They don't have anything with them. I'm sure they faced hardship. It says they cast out d demons or devils. That probably wasn't a lot of fun. I mean, they had seen Jesus do it, right? But now they're doing it, and they're interacting themselves with evil. So that can be, just like we talked about earlier, that can be, doing the work of the Lord can be kind of tiresome, right? It's a, it can be burdensome physically, mentally on the body, and Jesus recognizes that. And after they get done giving him their after-action report, telling him all that they had seen and done and what had happened to him, verse 31 says, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart unto a desert place and rest for a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. They were hungry. They were tired. Who knows how far they had walked? Who knows what they had encountered? We don't know. Someday, and this is, this is one of those things, right, when we get to heaven and we talk about this, in, in all seriousness, right? We're going to have the opportunity to meet these 12, well, 11 of the 12, <laughs> Right? And sit down with them and say, okay, guys, what happened? Tell, tell us what happened here in verses 7 through 13 of Mark chapter 6. What did you do? And then when they come back and they report to Jesus, Jesus is excited by the stories that they tell and the encounters that they have. Of course, he already knows. And he says, okay, guys, now let's go take a break. In, in the military, we would call that what? Art, rest and relaxation, recuperation, or what? But rest and relaxation, right? At least it involved food. <laughs> Remember, they didn't take any bread with them. They were dependent upon God to provide for their needs when they were out there. And I'm sure that not every village they went to to present the gospel, hey, guess what? You're sinners and you need to repent. Probably didn't get received very well, so they may not have eaten for several days because the village didn't. Uh, and Jesus told them, listen, don't, don't spend time there. Kick off the dust and keep moving. So they come back, they're hungry. And Jesus, their commander, as any good commander would, recognizes that they just need to take a break. And that's what they did. And he's even an example of that. We, saw, we see many times in, in the Gospels where Jesus himself went off into a desert place or went off somewhere alone to pray, to recover, right? And that's what he did with, with the disciples here. Um. And then verse 32, and they departed into a desert place by ship privately, right? So they went off by themselves into the desert um, for a, a, a time of relaxation. First Corinthians, let's go to First Corinthians. Now, we're not going to get through a lot of this. We've looked at some of the, First Corinthians chapter 12, I'm sorry. First Corinthians 12, uh, and starting at verse 12. We're not going to go through all of these verses here, but, but this is, um, excuse me, this is Paul writing about the body, the body of Christ, which is the church. It's us, right? This is us. And talking about, uh, in verse 12, for as the body is one, what is the one body? The church, Jesus Christ, right, is one. In the body, he's, t he's using the metaphor of the body. A human body is what he's using, right, as the example here. So there's one body. There's not many bodies. They're not all, you know, a whole bunch of different. Th there's one. Being many, uh, uh, let's see, all, 
uh, hath uh, one body and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So there's a, there's a whole lot in that one verse. But the key to that one verse is the word one. Right? So for us as Christians, what we have to understand is, and we'll get into what, what Paul is getting after here about the different duties, responsibilities, and based on the, the part of the body. But we have to understand there's only one. And when you accept Jesus as your Savior, you enter into that one body, you become part of that one body, which means everyone in the entire world who's ever accepted or who will ever accept him as Savior becomes part of that one body. Doesn't matter where you're from, doesn't matter what color you are, it doesn't matter what you eat for dinner, it doesn't matter, none of that matters, doesn't matter what language, everyone becomes part of the same body, one body, right? And verse 13 talks about that, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, so the baptism of the spirit is the salvation experience, right? Whether you be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, so it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile. Well, so if a Jew accepts Christ as Savior, are they still a Jew? I guess technically they are, but now you're part of the body of Christ, right? So you're, you're part of this. If we become, so, so there's no difference then between us as Gentiles and the Jew. What about the Palestinian or the Muslim or, you know, if they accept Christ as Savior? They're part of the same body, right? We, we have to, we have to under, because there's one spirit, one baptism, whether we be bond or free, so slave or free, um, and have been made to drink into that one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And then we go through verse uh, 15 talks about the foot and the hand, right? And we go, 16 talks about the ears and the eyes, and we go through the rest of this. And, and you all are very familiar with this, I'm sure. And the whole point of what Paul's getting at here is that we're all together unified for one particular purpose. And we all have different responsibilities within the body, but we're all part of the same body. The ear doesn't see, right? The eyes don't hear. You don't walk on your hands. Well, I guess some people do, maybe. Right, but the body was designed with each, each piece of it, internal as well as external. And as we see later, the things that we see and the things that we don't see, they're all there for a purpose, but it's all part of one singular body. And, and what Paul's getting at is not one is more important than the other. Because the body doesn't function properly unless it, you can see. So when you take sight away, that's a huge handicap. Hearing, right? If you lose a limb. So each, each piece of the body is important, and it has a specific purpose and something to do, and, and that's, what, um, that's what the church is all about. We each come to the church with different experiences, different backgrounds, different gifts, different things th that we're able to do. And it's all to come together. When we look at, within the military, when we look at certain specialized units that function at extremely, Will and I were talking about some of this uh, earlier, but when you look at, let's say, a special forces team, an operational detachment within special forces. There's 12 men on that team, 12. There's a commander, there's an assistant, and then you have an operations guy, you have communications, medics, uh, and weapons. Now, they, they know each other's positions, each other's jobs and things, and they can fill in, but 
the guy who's running the radio that's a communications guy, he's not any more important than the guy who's responsible for weapons or the guy who's planning operations. And you have a commander who's, who's organizing and controlling this. And the team doesn't function well if somebody thinks I'm better than somebody else or I'm, I'm more skilled than someone else. These types of units would not be successful if that's the way, that's the mentality that they have. They have to understand what each person's strengths and weaknesses are so we can compensate for that, right? But I don't set myself up as more important or better than someone else. The team has to function together, especially when you're doing specialized operations like that that are extremely dangerous. And we're facing an adversary that wants to take us down, that wants us out of the fight. So we can't go out there alone. We have to recognize that we need each other and part of this and that we each have different skill sets but we're all part of one team, one body, for one purpose. Now, go a uh, couple chapters back, and we'll close up here. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And this is probably the most important part of this whole discussion this morning about teamwork and teams. Look at 1 Corinthians 3, verses 6 through 9. Paul writing again here says, I, <clears throat> or actually, actually let's go back to verse 5. Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? So he's saying, who am I? Who's Apollos? We're just ministers. We're doing what we're told to do. We're following the command of our Lord. He's no better than me. I'm no better than him. We have the same mission. We're doing what we're supposed to do. Verse 6 says, Paul's says about himself, I have planted. So he's planted the seed of the gospel. Apollos came and watered. But who gave the increase? God. Okay? So Paul's saying, listen, I, I planted the seed. He, who, whoever is, is you know, uh, uh, getting saved as a result of my ministry, I dropped the message first, and then along came someone else who continued, you know, gave it some water. So Paul, Paul's saying, listen, I, I'm not taking credit. Don't look at me. We're just doing what we're told to do. I plant the seed. Somebody else comes. Paul could have been the one that came along behind somebody else and watered, right? It doesn't really matter. The point is that the increase or the result, the fruit of that, came from God himself. Verse 7, so then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth. So those of us that are in the ministry that are doing what we're supposed to do, that are taking the gospel, we're really nothing but servants. Because it all comes from God. But God hath given the increase, right? God is the one because that's where the salvation comes from. Salvation doesn't come from the pastor, doesn't come from a teacher. doesn't. No, the salvation comes from God himself. Verse 8. Now he that planteth and planteth and watereth are one. They are servants. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. Okay. So we, we are then rewarded for our works individually. Okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> We're in this together as a team. But when it comes time to receive reward, guess what? Your involvement in the mission that the team is engaged in will be judged individually. If we are part of a church that is very successful with pushing the gospel out, people are getting saved, but yet I'm not engaged, what's my reward? Right? So there's a fairness, there's an equity, if you will, in the way God rewards those that are part of his, are, are involved in his service. Verse 9, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry and God's building, according to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. Paul says he laid the foundation. Think about building a house, right? He lays the foundation. Somebody builds on top of that. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Going back to verse 9, we are laborers together with God. So God is 
part of our team. He is the most important part of our team because he's the one that gives the increase. The fruit comes from him. All we need to do is be faithful servants, faithfully engaged in what we're supposed to do. And God will take care of the rest. Okay? We got to end. Any questions? Any comments? We got to make sure God's on our team. Or actually, let me say it this way we're on his team. <laughs> We're on his team. Okay. All right. Lord, we thank you for this day. Be with us now as we move into uh, the, the worship and preaching hour. Uh, Lord, may you be part of that service. May we hear from you today. Bless our pastor. Give him the words to speak. Uh, and may we be thankful and grateful for all you will uh, show us today. In Jesus' name, amen.